Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to see you here today at Westminster United Church, where we've been pulling together to get things done for the glory of God for 144 years. Uh, thankfully, the weather is not uh, too warm yet, and as long as it continues like this, we'll meet in the sanctuary. When it does start to get a little too hot, we will likely move to the gymnasium, but it's great to see you here. It's so good to be back together in person, and uh, we thank God for that. Um, we are record, still recording the services, and they're posted on the website, um, so that if you want to watch it again, or you uh, know someone who wasn't able to be here, they can uh, watch the recorded version. So we've got a couple of um, happy birthdays today. Jerome, whose birthday is today, and I have a feeling that the thing Jerome really wanted for his birthday may not happen which is a Stanley Cup for the Montreal Canadiens, but hey, have a happy birthday anyway. <laughs> uh, and Lena uh, on July 9th and Bev on July 10th. So happy birthday uh, to you all. We're going to light our Christ candle. Each week we gather in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the light of the world. We remember that he is the light that shines into us, into our hearts, and that we take that light with us as we, as we leave this place. So let us gather in the light of Christ. Let's um, begin with words from Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time and forevermore. People of God. Let us worship the Lord. Our opening hymn this morning is Fairest Lord Jesus.
Please be seated. And let us pray. Feed us now, Lord Jesus, as you fed your first disciples. Feed us with the bread of life that never leaves us hungry, that awakens in us that perfect love that casts out all our fear. Feed us with the bread of hope that strengthens our hands to serve the broken and lost in your name. Feed us so that we may be fulfilled with, that same, with some of that joy which the universe cannot contain. For your love's sake, amen. Well, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to brag for a minute. Uh, around 1986, uh, I won first prize at the Van Cleef Hill Fall Fair for my bread. I was very proud. Now, uh, it turned out that I was the only entry in that category, but I still won first prize. But uh, the first time I told you that, like now, I'm sure you're thinking, well, that's great. You must have been very happy. Uh, when I tell it to you once, you say, that's nice. If I tell it to you twice, you might say, yeah, I think I heard about that. But if I talked about it every time I heard you, or I met you rather, uh, you would probably head the other direction because you wouldn't want to hear about it again. It's like the man who brags about the fish that he caught. It was this big. You know, it gets a little bit tiring after a while. The problem with bragging is that it makes things all about us, right? It makes us talk all the time about ourselves. And if you're the person listening, it might be very interesting to you, but if you're the person listening, uh, it really isn't. It's okay to tell others when we've done something that is, we're proud of, something that we've accomplished, something uh, that we are really good at. It's okay to talk about that, but it crosses a line uh, when it becomes all about us and not about the other person. You know, the things that we do and the things that we have, our gifts and our abilities, um, they're, they're good for us, but they're also meant to be blessings. They're meant to be things that we share with others, not just things that draw attention to us. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning in our worship. So let's join together now in the prayer that Jesus taught us all to say. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Our first scripture uh, reading this morning is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12. Let us hear the word of God. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but not on my own half, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weakness. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me even considering the exceptional character of these revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being uh, too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of God, Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, 
hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Our second <clears throat> lesson is from the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 6. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense with him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Amen. And may God add to these readings from his holy word. To God's name be all honor and praise. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are hungry for good news. Let the heavenly, heavenly food of your scripture nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. This we pray through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Well, my mother-in-law, being from Scotland, uh, had a whole treasury of very colorful expressions, some of which you're able to, I'm able to repeat in church, and some of which I am not. And uh, one of her favorite sayings was, all her eggs have two yolks, or all his eggs have two yolks. That's what she would say about somebody who was always bragging. And we know people like that, right? Their kids are the smartest, their job is the greatest, their car is the latest, their house is the biggest, their lives are the most interesting, and no matter what you've done, they've done more of it or better. Everyone's eggs have one yolk, but theirs all have two yolks. Well, I once had a colleague like that. I really liked her, and she was an extremely good minister. But whenever I was around her, I always felt a little bit inadequate. And that's because her church was the best, and her programs were the most successful, and her sermons always hit the mark, and she always had a story. She was amazing. And she name-dropped constantly, so you'd be really impressed by all the interesting people she knew. We call this bragging, or boasting. And our word boast has an interesting history. It originated in Old English and German words that mean to inflate, to blow up, to swell, to puff up. Boasters are people who are full of themselves, right? And back in the mists of time, the word bellows, you know, the thing that you use to fan a fire, the word bellows came from the same root as the word boast. Boasting is a way of inflating yourself, of elevating yourself and your accomplishments above others. Now, boasting is different, though, from the joy and pride that we rightfully feel when we accomplish something noteworthy. Uh, it's okay to express pride when you graduate from university or get a promotion or do something special. When my granddaughter was uh, three or four, whenever she met someone, she would say, my name is Nina, I'm three years old, and I have long, beautiful hair. She wasn't boasting, 
Uh, she wasn't boasting, she was expressing childlike delight and joy in an aspect of herself that she was proud of and that people often complimented her on. Knowing that we've done a good job or that we have certain gifts is not in and of itself boasting. It only becomes boasting when it's designed to make the boaster feel superior and other people feel inferior. And the reason boasters get on our nerves is that they not only do they think that they are amazing, but they want you to think that they are better than you are. Now, psychologists will tell us something interesting. They'll tell us that someone who is constantly boasting is often covering up a deep-seated sense of insecurity. You know, they talk about how great they are to compensate for the fact that they don't feel great about themselves at all. It's superiority on the outside, but inferiority on the inside. If that's all that boasting was, though, it might be annoying, it might be difficult for the person who does it, but it's pretty harmless. The thing about boasting, though, is that, uh, you know, building yourself up, is that it often goes hand in hand with tearing someone else down. You know, you need to cut another person down to size in order to build yourself up. You need to make yourself look better by making others look worse. A certain former president of the United States has perfected this form of boasting. <laughs> Everything about him is the greatest, the biggest, the most amazing, the most beautiful, never seen before in the history of the world. But the mirror image of that self-regard is contempt for people who don't adore him or agree with him. And we know that he has created a whole movement of people, many of whom also don't feel great about themselves. They're people who feel they've been ignored, neglected, left behind, mistreated, and they try to build themselves up by demonizing and vilifying those they blame for their troubles. Well, St. Paul, in his letters, had an awful lot to say about boasting. You know, the three words that Paul uses most often in his Gospels are faith, love, and gospel. And you'd expect that, though. Those are pretty important words for Christian faith. But the fourth most frequently occurring word in his letters is boast. Isn't that interesting? He uses the word boast over 50 times. 25 alone in 2 Corinthians, from which we read today. Paul believed that boasting was not just an annoying habit, not just in bad taste, but it was actually a tremendous spiritual danger. That's because boasting puts us at the center. It makes everything about us. It makes us think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And at the same time, it lowers others. Boasting is a sign of the heart that has removed God and Jesus and neighbor from the center and replaced them with ourselves, which was the primal sin of Adam and Eve, wanting to be like God, wanting to be in God's place. So that's a, And that's a danger both for individuals and for communities. Now, if boasting was just showing off and tooting your own horn, it would be easy to recognize it and stop doing it. But we're sneaky. In fact, we're so sneaky sometimes that we fool ourselves. We're clever at finding ways to boast without sounding like we're boasting. Uh, hiding our boasting behind a mask, dressing it up in a disguise. I read an article recently about humble bragging. And uh, humble bragging is bragging in a way that makes you sound like you're actually criticizing yourself when you're not, when you're bragging. As in, you know, I just look so terrible. Uh, since I've lost all this weight, my clothes are just way too big on me. That's humble bragging. Or don't you just hate it when, they, when you go into a store and they won't break a $100 bill? Or I said the most embarrassing thing when I ran into Justin Bieber the other day. You know, you're... Sound like you're tearing yourself down, but you're actually bragging. Bragging while looking humble. Well, there are other kinds of disguised boasting. And we see one of them in our scripture reading from Mark today, when Jesus goes back to his 
hometown synagogue. You know, I remember in the early years of my ministry when I would be invited back to my home congregation, Lincoln Avenue United in Cambridge, uh, to preach the occasional sermon. And um, everyone was always delighted to see me. We remember you as a little boy, the, the uh, older ladies would say. You were such a troublemaker in Sunday school, they'd say with a wink and a grin. Their joy and pride and how I had turned out was heartfelt and genuine. And that's often the case in families and communities, isn't it? Everybody gets to share in the success of the hometown boy or hometown girl who has done well. Uh, you know, um, so the, you know, the whole city of Brantford gets to bask in the reflected glory of Wayne Gretzky. How different it was, though, for Jesus on his trip home. If you were here last Sunday, you heard uh, what happened immediately before this but a couple of Jesus' most spectacular healings, the healing of the woman with the hemorrhage and the raising of Jairus' daughter. People were beside themselves with astonishment, and Jesus' fame was spreading far and wide. At first, it sounded like Jesus' own hometown folks were going to share in that amazement. Where did he get this wisdom, they said? How can he do all of these amazing things that we've been hearing about? But the mood quickly changed. Wait a minute, somebody said. He's Mary's kid. He's just a carpenter. We babysat him. We changed his diapers for heaven's sake. We know his brothers and sisters. He's nobody special. He's just like us. Who does he think he is? And it says they took offense at him. In order to feel better about themselves, they had to cut Jesus down to size. They had to diminish his achievements. We're not like that. We're not full of ourselves the way Jesus is. The tragedy of it all was that they were depriving and hurting themselves. Because of their hard and resistant hearts, they denied to themselves the benefit of what Jesus did to, uh, for others. And it says he could do no deeds of power there among them. My daughter counsels people with addictions. And she says um, there's a common pattern in families where drug abuse and addiction is widespread. And that is to, uh, when, when one member of the family decides to get help, um, to seek assistance, to um, you know, get sober, get clean, there's a lot of resentment directed towards that person by the rest of the family. And it comes out in this way. She's no better than, sh than we are. Who does she think she is? We see this in churches, too, you know, snarky criticism uh, directed towards a neighboring church that is thriving and growing. An attitude of, well, they must really be pulling the wool over somebody over people's eyes. They're not that great. They're no better than we are. They're not special. Who do they think they are? Well, this doesn't sound like boasting exactly. It's rooted in the same impulse of the heart to try to elevate ourselves in comparison to others if necessary, by cutting them down. Another form of this impulse is uh, false humility. This is a way to outsource boasting by letting somebody else do it for us. So when somebody compliments you, you say, oh, no, that, that was really nothing. I, uh, it's not that great. I, did, I didn't do a good job. And then others say, no, 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 you're selling yourself short. You're awesome. You're wonderful. So you get the satisfaction of the boast, but uh, you come off looking better about yourself than you would if you had said it yourself. I was on a Zoom meeting the other night when someone thanked me for some work that I had done. And I said, well, it wasn't just me. I mean, a lot of people helped with that. A lot of people contributed to it. Everybody pitched in. And then another person cut in and said, Paul, just accept the thanks, okay? There's a story about a rabbi who stood up in his synagogue on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the day when Jews uh, confess their sins to God and ask for forgiveness. And the rabbi said in a loud voice, God have mercy on me, a miserable nobody. Well, the cantor, the, the singer who led the chants, he saw this, so he also stood up and said, God have mercy on me, a miserable nobody. And then the, the lowly sexton, the caretaker, who was sweeping the floor, decided he would follow their example. God have mercy on me, a miserable nobody. And then the rabbi turned to the cantor and says, Huh, 
Who does he think he is being a nobody? <laughs> what looks like humbleness can actually be a hidden kind of boastfulness and pride. Well, our passage in 2 Corinthians today is a part of a long section where Paul explores at length the nature of boasting. Paul was aware of his own tendency to boast. Um, he was a brilliant and accomplished man. He had lots to boast about, but he had to learn from experience how dangerous boasting can be. He also recognized boasting as the besetting sin in the Corinthian church. Now, if we could go time travel and go back in the past and attend that church in Corinth, we'd be impressed. What an amazing church, we would say. Vibrant, growing, energetic, active. What powerful preaching. What inspiring worship. What amazing music. Look at all the children. So many talented people. But the fact is it was a deeply conflicted and divided church because people thought that their giftedness made them better than others. They bragged about themselves and they put down others they didn't think were as gifted as they were. Paul had started the church in Corinth, but he had to keep in touch from a distance by writing letters. In his absence, though, other teachers uh, began to gain influence over the people by parading their superior qualifications. They claimed to be more filled with the Spirit, to have had more powerful experiences of God than Paul had. They spoke in tongues and performed miracles. They captivated others with their words. They brought many new people into the church. They thought they were much more sophisticated and inspiring than Paul. And they were undercutting the work that Paul had done uh, to help that church grow into greater maturity. They didn't see Paul as a partner, but as a rival. And they tried to secure their own position by bragging about their abilities and denigrating Paul's. And Paul takes them to task. He says, look, I could boast all day long if I wanted to. My abilities, education, family pedigree are second to none. And he said, if you want to talk about amazing spiritual experiences, have I got one for you? 14 years ago, he said, I was whisked up by God into heaven and shown things that no one has ever seen or heard before. Now that is something that he could have boasted about. He was taken as close to God as anyone could be, but he chooses not to boast about it. In fact, he talks about it as though it happened to someone else. The reason he's not going to boast about this experience is that something else happened in his life that was even more profound. In order to keep me from being elated, he said, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Now this has always been a bit of a mystery. No one knows what this thorn in the flesh was. Some think it was, think it was literally a physical ailment, an illness, a disability, a speech impediment. Or maybe it was more of an inner torment, a mental health crisis of depression or anxiety. Or maybe a temptation to sin. Whatever it was, it caused him great pain and anguish, made him doubt himself. It, made, it threatened to derail his work. What we do know is that Paul was sure that this thorn in the flesh was sent by God. Now why would God do that? Why would God torment him in that way? Why would God be responsible for something that could have caused this tireless missionary uh, to go off the rails? Paul prayed and he prayed and he prayed that it would be taken away. Has that ever happened to you? Please, God, please take away this torment. But the answer to his prayer was not what, it expect, what he expected. The thorn in the flesh remained, but he was given a life-changing insight that God's grace was all he needed. And that the power of God's grace was often most visible at those places where he was at his weakest, not at his strongest. While he was starting churches and standing up fearlessly to his opponents, Paul could have easily thought that this was all down to his talent and ability. The, th the thorn in the flesh taught him that God's power was most visible when he was weak, not strong. 
Paul made a similar point earlier in 2 Corinthians. He said that the gospel, the good news, the message of Jesus is like a priceless treasure and God has placed that treasure in clay jars. Ordinary, everyday, chipped, broken uh, clay jars. Well, we're, of course, those jars. We are the containers in which God has placed that treasure. And God works in us in spite of our imperfections and uh, weaknesses. Why? To show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. If I'm going to boast, Paul said, I'll boast about that. Not what I do, but what God does through me, even when I'm at my weakest. If I'm going to boast... I will boast in the Lord. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. That was the answer to Paul's prayer. Now this was not a when life hands you lemons make lemonade scenario. It wasn't about Paul's resilience or ability to turn a difficult situation around. That thorn in the flesh was not taken away. But God continued to work through Paul by grace, even when he felt personally too weak to be of any use. Different parts of Scripture speak different, speak uh, more clearly at different times, and I think that this text is one that we really need to hear, especially today, because we're at a time when the Christian Church and those who profess Christian faith are marked by weakness. To growing numbers of people. What we stand for is irrelevant at best, offensive at worst. And part of that is perhaps of our own making. The institutional church and the practices of its members have often departed from the message of Jesus. We're having to come to terms with that right now through the legacy of the residential schools. And many who might find hope and joy in Jesus don't because of the way his friends and followers have behaved, so we have to own that. Jesus, though, sent his disciples out without baggage or backup, with nothing but his authority to announce his power to set people free. Their success was not measured by the sides of the crowds they attracted or the success of their programs, but only by whether they followed their teachers' instructions. In these times, the church needs to recover that model of discipleship and use it for guidance. Many of us are also aware of the weakness in our personal lives. We have our own thorns in the flesh, the weakness of advancing age, declining health, financial worries, family problems, doubts and fears, grief and loss. What was revealed to Paul in his weakness was that God had him right where God wanted him to be. Once he accepted that his resources were not enough, And that he couldn't make all of his problems go away. Not by trying hard, not by praying hard. God's amazing grace had room to work in him fully and freely. The point is to always live by grace. When we're strong and capable and energetic, we live by grace. When we're strong and effective, we live by grace. Our strengths aren't ours to boast about, but gifts from God to serve God and our neighbor in love. And when we feel fragile and under attack, to live by grace. Our weaknesses are an opportunity for God to work in us and through us in the most surprising ways. God's grace is sufficient for us. It's it's all we need when we're strong, when we're weak, when we're thriving, when we're struggling, when we're on top of the mountain, when we're down in the valley. It's grace always grace. And that is something we can really boast about. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let's sing again in preparation for gathering at the Lord's table. Break now the bread of life.
please standing as you're able and join in the words of the new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And let us join together in prayer. God, you are our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. You are the one whom Jesus called Abba, Father, the giver of every good and perfect gift. So hear us as we pray for your church and all its ministries here at Westminster, in the city of St. Catharines, in Canada, and throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the work of justice and the healing of creation, we pray for the uh, will in leaders and ordinary people to address pressing problems such as the climate crisis. We pray especially for those affected by the extreme heat in British Columbia. For our friends and neighbors in the United States of America on this 4th of July holiday. For repairing of injustices to First Nations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the care of strangers, neighbors, family, friends, those we name before you now in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those suffering from sickness, sorrow, violence, or fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those broken by the world, especially our neighbors around us who are poor, homeless, addicted, unemployed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those nearing death and for all who love them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, in your loving purpose, answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes. And in all things for which we pray, give us the wisdom and grace to accept your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This is the uh, time in our service when we uh, dedicate our offering. Uh, as you know, you can leave your offering at the plates at the two doors. You can uh, make your offering by check through the mail or dropping it off at the church. Uh, you can make your offering by e-transfer or by signing up for PAR, pre-authorized remittance. In whatever way you do, uh, please continue to support the ministry of Westminster, but see it also as an act of your personal faith in which you take what God has given you and return it so that it may be used for God's purposes. So as we dedicate our offering, let us sing uh, the doxology. Please stand. for us and whose power is made perfect in weakness, in our weakness and insufficiency, we offer our lives and the gifts of our living for the work of your mustard seed kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
Please be seated. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of life, the true vine, I invite you to come to this table. Come not because you are rich, but because you are poor. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because of the greatness of your faith, but because you desire the mercy of the Lord. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us uh, join together in the great prayer of thanksgiving as you are able. Please participate in the responses that will be projected on the screen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right that we should praise you, gracious, gracious God, for you created all things. You formed us in your image, male and female, you created us. When we turned away from you in sin, you did not cease to care for us and opened a path of salvation for all people. You made a covenant with Israel and through your servants Abraham and Sarah gave the promise of a blessing for all nations. Through Moses, you led your people from bondage into freedom. Through the prophets, you renewed your promise of salvation Therefore, with them and all your saints who have served you in every age, we give thanks and raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, source of life and goodness, all creation rightly gives you praise. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, and to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He healed the sick and ate and drank with outcasts and sinners. He opened the eyes of the blind and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to those in need. In all things, he fulfilled your gracious will. On the night he freely gave himself up to, uh, to death, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Whenever you eat it, do so in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Gracious God, this per uh, his perfect sacrifice destroys the power of sin and death. By raising him to life, you give us life forevermore. And therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection, and looking for his coming again in glory, we offer you, Father, this bread and this cup. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, which is broken for you. This is the blood of Christ, which is poured out for you. These are God's gifts for God's people. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So you each have your little communion cup. If you take off the top, uh, take off the top cover, uh, you can now par par uh, partake of the bread.
And whenever you're ready, you can remove the second cover and uh, take the cup. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, as we have proclaimed your death and received your life in the eating of this bread and drinking this cup, help us to wait for you, to hope for you, to watch for you, so that when you come again, you will find us ready. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is uh, number 481, Sent Forth by God's Blessing. Go now and wherever people will hear you, proclaim the life-changing love of God. Do not fear your weakness, for when you are weak, Christ's strength is made known. Travel lightly, live simply, and honor those who welcome the gospel. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and always. Go in God's peace. Amen.